What can someone do to shore up their immune system while this is all going on? Well, a couple things. Um, first of all, just being as healthy as you can be. You know, wait, wait. You know, I'm I'm getting up there right now where, you know, it becomes more and more of a challenge to stay, you know, in good shape. You know, the more you can do to do that, um, something you know all about, you know, is keeping in shape is really important. Uh, the second thing is if you're on medications, like for blood, high blood pressure, don't. Don't miss them. Take those drugs because they're really important. Even though they may not appear, simp- you know, you don't have any symptoms of high blood pressure or something like that. And then I think just, you know, getting sleep and eating a healthy diet. And that's about what we can do today to help get you prepared for this. What else can people do in terms of all this hand sanitizer jazz and masks? Is that all? Yeah. The hand sanitizers actually are a great thing for stopping a lot of infectious diseases. They actually are really good. They're good for your hands, uh, you know, in terms of the skin. They kill the bad bugs. But the whole issue of using your hands touching your face that people all concentrate on, yes. the data is actually very weak that this kind of virus is going to be transmitted that way. So well, I wouldn't tell you to stop using hand sanitizers, but don't think it's going to have a big impact on this bug. Do you see that viral video that's going around, that woman who was uh, giving the address at the behest of the White House? And uh, she, she, they, she tells people not to touch their face and then immediately licks her finger and I turns did, the page. That. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Well, yeah. why is she telling people not to touch their faces? Because, you know, well, the, the thought was is that there are receptors around your eye right here that actually for this virus could get in and then get into your body. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the data we have on this is so sparse to say that that's the case. I think the primary thing about hand washing is, is legitimate, but one of the things we want, people want to do something. They want to be able to feel like they're doing something, and so we tell them, wash your hands often and to prevent this, to prevent this disease. And I feel like we're not being really honest with the people, that the data, and, and we've looked at this very carefully, really is about just breathing air, and that's a hard thing to stop. So keep doing the hand washing, but don't think that that's going to stop this disease. But you asked about the masks. It's going to stop other stuff. Yes, the masks. There's two kinds. Right. Basically the surgical mask, which just fits over. And the reason it's called a surgical mask is because it's loose fitting, just fits, you know, kind of ties behind you. It was worn, worn by surgeons so that they don't cough or drip into your wound. And it was never made to protect you from bugs coming in. So those little spaces on the sides, that's not a problem if I'm breathing into the cloth right in front of my nose. But in terms of the air coming in on the side, they're not, they're not effective at all. So people wear them. They look like they're doing something they're not. Now, if you are sick, they may help a little bit from you transmitting because if you cough, then you cough right into that cloth and it'll, some of it will embed in there and not get out around. The other one, though, is called an N95 respirator. But for all intents and purposes, it looks like a mask. It's just tight face fitting. It has a seal, even at the nose, et cetera. That's an apocalypse mask. I, it could be. I don't know what those are, but that could be. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm just saying that that's how I look at it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, they're actually, we use them all the time in healthcare all the time. And in, they use them, in, actually, about 90% of them are used in industry. So when they're grinding things or asbestos, et cetera, you know, they don't breathe in all these parts. So if we have one of those, that'll... They're very effective. They're very effective. The problem is we have a big shortage. Um, you know, right now we have hospitals that are down to just a couple of days worth of uh, these masks, the, the, the respirators, and it's because we don't stockpile anything in this country. You know, we don't have hospitals don't have the money to do that. Those preppers right now are so excited. Yeah, all the preppers across the country. I knew it. I knew the day would come. Yeah, we well, they are. They are and, peaches and, and, and well, and you know, but well, this is really important because how healthcare workers go is how the country. I think we'll see where we're going. You know, there have been over four thousand healthcare workers in China who were infected, many of them on their job, and uh, a number of them died. And if in this country we have a real challenge delivering healthcare because we're overwhelmed, and then we have healthcare workers picking up the infection, like we talked about the group in Milan, um, and we don't have the protection for them, I really believe that's when the public will say, wait a minute, what's going on here? What we're talking about is a complete change in lifestyle for the next three months, six months, and maybe even longer. We just have to realize all over the world that we are now in a pandemic. This is unprecedented. We've never had this in our lifetimes before, and we're going to have to live differently. Now, we will get through this. Things will go back to normal. But for the next six months, we're really going to have to accommodate to preventing and delaying the spread of this virus. And yes, that will mean lots of social distancing. That means meticulous hygiene. 
It means avoiding crowded places, especially indoors. It means things like staggering the way the times we go to work so that there's not lots of people crowded together on public transport. It means working at home as much as we can and generally avoid going out. It means stopping shaking hands. It means stopping hugs and social kisses. Mm -hmm. We have to have this social distancing because this virus only survives inside human cells. It's only go, going to go from one person's respiratory system into another's. And if we can break that chain of transmission in as many cases as we can, then we're going to greatly delay that curve, push, push the peak back into summer, preferably back into late summer, when we have less people with influenza and other chronic winter-related diseases in our hospitals and flatten that curve down so that less people are going to be sick at any one period of time. That is now the aim. Wash your hands. Wash your hands a lot. I know you already wash your hands a lot because you're not disgusting, but wash your hands even more. Set up cues and routines in your life to get you to wash your hands. Wash your hands every time you enter and leave a building. Wash your hands when you go into a meeting and when you come out of a meeting. Get rituals there based around hand washing. Sanitize your phone. You touch that phone with your dirty, unwashed hands all the time. I know you take it into the bathroom with you. <laughs> so sanitize your phone and consider not using it as often in public. Maybe TikTok and Instagram could be home things only. Don't touch your face. Don't rub your eyes. Don't bite your fingernails. Don't wipe your nose on the back of your hand. I mean, don't do that anyway, because gross. <laughs> don't wear a face mask. Face masks are for sick people and healthcare providers. If you're sick, your face mask holds in all your coughing and sneezing and protects the people around you. And if you're a healthcare provider, your face mask is one tool in a set of tools called personal protective equipment that you're trained to use so that you can give patient care and not get sick yourself. If you're a regular healthy person wearing a face mask, it's just making your face sweaty. <laughs> Leave the face masks in stores for the doctors and the nurses and the sick people. If you think you have symptoms of COVID-19, stay home, call your doctor for advice. If you're diagnosed with COVID-19, remember it's generally very mild. And if you're a smoker, right now is the best possible time to quit smoking. I mean, if you're a smoker right now is always the best possible time to quit smoking. But if you're a smoker and you're worried about COVID-19, I guarantee that quitting is absolutely the best thing you can do to protect yourself from the worst impacts of COVID-19. Virtually every day I get lots and lots of emails and lots and lots of comments. How do I boost my immune system? People are asking, how do I increase my immunity to reduce my chances of getting the COVID-19 virus or of getting it less severely? And as I understand it, I don't know of any way to boost your immune system, but I do know of lots of, way to make, well, lots of ways to make it worse. So the human immune system is quite an amazing thing. It can recognize something like 9 billion foreign antigens, things that the body would recognize as foreign bacteria and viruses. Quite an amazing system. And I don't know of a way to boost it, but I know of plenty of ways to make it work less optimally, to reduce the efficiency of it. But of course, remember this COVID-19 is a novel virus. It hasn't been seen before. So the immune system is not going to recognize it and it's going to have to start making its antibodies. It's going to have to start the immunological process from scratch. So how do I get my immune system to be as good as it can be is the real question. So you can't boost immunity, but you can make it worse. So how do we make it as good as we can make it? Well, the first thing is make sure you get plenty of sleep. Lack of sleep will reduce immunity. So good sleep is important. The second point is make sure you are well nourished. Now, people talk about taking lots of this nutrient or lots of that nutrient or eating lots of that to give protective effects. And the evidence for that really is not strong if it's there at all. So I would say get plenty of good nutrition. So we want lots of plant products, lots of flavonoids. <clears throat> flavonoids are in the colored components of plants. Um, so lots of fresh nutrients as much as, we, as a, you know, lots of fr fresh fruit and vegetables, enough protein. We don't need to eat masses of protein. We don't need huge amounts of protein, but we need enough protein. Now, the nutrient that we're often short of in the northern hemispheres is vitamin D. 
So I'm currently taking a vitamin D supplement. That's the only supplement I'm taking at the moment, just vitamin D, because that's the only one I'm likely to be short of. So by taking huge amounts of extra nutrients, I'm not going to boost my immune system, but by being low on any nutrient, I can reduce the efficiency of my immune system. And because there's no sunshine over, over English winters, I, I take vitamin D because my skin won't make it. And we know that vitamin D deficiency is associated with immune deficiency. So nutrition is one thing, but no evidence for these fads that you should eat lots and lots of garlic or lots and lots of vitamin C. Don't be short of these things. I mean, garlic's good for you anyway. And it's got plant flavonoids and nutrients in it, so it's good. But taking huge amounts of it, as I understand it, will not boost the immune system because I don't think it's possible to boost the immune system. It's only possible to keep it working at its normal, healthy, optimum level. Now, psychological stress can reduce immune function. So try and, try and reduce your stress. That's a ludicrous thing to say. I'm not quite sure how you do that. But, uh, but, but try and, and reduce stress as much as you can. Socialising and sharing things is probably one of the best ways to do that. Uh, do keep fit if you can. Exercise is good. Regular exercise is good because these things optimise health. And if you optimise health, you're likely to optimise immunity. Get plenty of fresh air. Good ventilation, I think, is important. How serious is this? Is this something that we need to be terrified of? Or is this overblown? Or how, how do you stand on this? Well, first of all, you have to understand the timing of it in the sense that it's just beginning. And so in terms of what hurt, pain, suffering, death has happened so far is really just beginning. Um, this is going to unfold for months to come yet. And that's, I think, what people don't quite yet understand. Um, what we saw in China, uh, I'm convinced, as are many of my colleagues, as soon as they release all of these uh, social distancing, these mandated stay in homes, haven't left their home in weeks and weeks kind of thing, when they go back to work, they're on planes, trains, subways, buses, crowded spaces, manufacturing plants, even China is going to come back again. And so this really is acting like an influenza virus, something that transmits very, very easily through the air. We now have data to show that you're infectious before you even get sick. And in some cases, quite highly infectious, just breathing is all that you need to do. So from this perspective, I can understand why people would say, well, wait a minute, flu kills a lot more itself every year than this does. And I re remind people this just was beginning. Probably the best guesstimate we have right now on what limited data we have would say this is going to be at least 10 to 15 times worse than the worst se seasonal flu year we see. 10 to 15 times worse in terms of fatalities? Yeah, or? yeah, and, and just illness. In fact, I just I brought some numbers. We uh, conservatively estimate that this could in, uh, require 48 million hospitalizations, 96 million uh, cases actually occurring, over 480,000 deaths that can occur over the next three to seven months with this situation. So this is not one that to take lightly. We have an employee at our Center for Infectious Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, and she has a dear friend who lives in Milan, Italy, and she works at a hospital there, and she texts this to this employee of ours last night. And this was an email that came out yesterday from one of their physicians in Milan at the largest hospital there, and he said, I just got a very disturbing message from a cardiologist at one of the Milan's largest hospitals. They're deciding who they have to let die. They aren't screening the staff anymore because they need all hands on deck, and they have very small areas of the hospital dedicated to non-COVID patients where they still screen doctors. Everybody else is dedicated to COVID patients, so even if they're positive, meaning that they're sick, they don't, and, but they don't have a severe cough or fever, then they have to work. Uh, he says that that they're seeing an alarming number of cases in the 40-something age range, and as ho these are horrible cases. So we need to stop thinking that this is only an old person's disease. But this is what I'm going to unfold, not just in Wuhan, it's unfolding in Milan, it's unfolding here in, in Seattle, and this is what's going to continue to rollingly unfold throughout the world. Joel, we really have got to get information out to the public. There is so much misinformation right now. And, you know, we're going to be in this for a while. This is not going to happen overnight. And I worry. I keep telling people we're handling this like it's a corona blizzard, you know, two or three days. Mm -hmm. We're back to normal. This is a coronavirus winter. And we're going to have the next three months or more, six months or more, that are going to be like this. For the average person that is uh, sitting around reading these articles that say don't worry or reading these, ar there's these articles that say this is the end of humanity, what, 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 what could these people do? Like what, what could they do and what do they do if they get infected? 
Well, first of all, uh, neither of those kind of articles are correct, and we right. have to make sure that we get that message out to people that it's there. We need straight talk right now, you know, and, and part of it is it's so hard to – you hear from people who suppose experts, what's this going to happen or not happen, you know, uh, and, and let me just give you an example because we've heard a lot about, well, it's going to go away with – the, the, uh, the coronavirus with the seasons, okay? When it warms up, it'll go away. Well, you know, the other coronaviruses that we have that we've had to worry about was SARS, which appeared in 2003 in China. And when that came out of China in February 2003, it took us a little while to figure out that these people really aren't that infectious till day five or six of their illness. And then they really crash and burn and many of them would die. Um, but what we did was basically, by knowing that, identify these cases in their context quickly. And so if they had symptoms, brought them in, put them in these isolation rooms so they wouldn't infect anybody else. And it took until June to bring that under control. That had nothing to do with the seasons. MERS, which is another coronavirus that's in the Middle East, it's in the um, Arabian Peninsula, it, the natural reservoir for that is, is camels. In China, and by the way, SARS, it was palm civets, and we, a type of animal food the rodent, that we got out of the markets there. In the Arabian Peninsula, we're not going to euthanize 1.7 camels, you know, to try to get rid of MERS. And there, it's 110 degrees out, and this virus is transmitted fine, thank you. I mean, it goes from animals to people. It goes in the hospitals. It, there's no evidence that's seasonal there. So that's a good myth to expose right away. This is not something that's going to cure up when it gets warm. Uh, it, you know, if it does, it won't be because there's a model for it. it what will it be? Because how does, a, how does something like SARS run through a population and then stop being around anymore? Well, it wouldn't have, but had we had good public health, had we had... Uh, you know, the same kind of transmission we're seeing with this coronavirus where you're infectious before you ever get sick, where you're highly infectious. Remember with SARS, now you didn't really get infectious until you're in six or, you know, six days of illness and you knew that you were in trouble. And then you could isolate you. And we didn't understand that at first and we trans, you know, the virus transmitted. So that's why SARS stopped. MERS stops because we don't get rid of the camels so it keeps hitting humans day after day. But then when they go to the hospital, we no longer allow those individuals to transmit to others in the hospital because we do what we call good infection control. As soon as they get there, they're in special rooms with special masks and all this kind of thing. And so in that regard, uh, these coronaviruses can be stopped. This one's not. As I said at the top of the program, this is uh, like trying to stop the wind. Influenza transmission, you never hear anybody saying in a bad flu, seasonal flu year, um, you know, we're going to stop this one. If you don't have a vaccine that works, you don't. Um, it's just breathing. That's all it is. So what's best case scenario here? Well, I think as I laid out to you before, uh, you know, this could be 10 times worse than a really bad seasonal flu year. And uh, it, I'll grant you it will, it will hit, you know, primarily the older population and those with underlying health problems. But as I mentioned also, you know, we have a lot of people who have other risk factors. Obesity, high blood pressure is another risk factor where you can have a really bad outcome with this. And so we don't quite know what it's going to do yet. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've been right on the mark predicting where it's going to be to today. I think from here on out, I can tell you it's going to stay around for months. It's not going to go away tomorrow. we got to stop thinking about if we just get through tomorrow, that's it. So if we're going to close schools, we're going to tell people not to go into public, we're going to cancel big events, how long are we prepared to do that? What are we going to do? We have to ask ourselves that. I think the big thing is, is eventually enough people get infected where it'll be like putting reactors in the rods, you know, rods in the reaction, I should say, and then that stops it by itself. But, um, how so? Because if you're if, – if, Two of the three of us in this room were immune right now to it because we'd had it and recovered and had protection because of natural protection. Then I couldn't transmit to anybody. So that's what's going to happen if you get enough people who get infected. Ultimately, uh, then it'll s slow down and stop transmission that way. But that's a heck of a price to pay to get there. Yeah, I'm at home taking a jacuzzi, smoking a little stogie. Eh. Mm. I just finished a bike ride and a little bit of workout. And I just, you know, keep staying at home and away from the crowds and away from outside. The reason why I'm saying that is because I still see photographs and videos of people sitting in outside cafes all over the world and having a good time and hanging out in crowds. That is not wise because that's how you can get the virus. That's how you get it. Like contact with other people. So stay away from crowds, stay away from being in restaurants and outdoor cafes, especially now in springtime where all the kids are going to the beach and celebrate and drink and all that stuff. This is not a good idea. So stay away from the crowds, go home 
and then we can overcome this whole problem, this whole virus in no time. But you got to go and follow those orders. Just remember, stay at home, don't don't go to crowds. Put that cookie down. So I've come to the sink now to wash my hands. And I don't want the water hot and I don't want the water cold. I want it medium. So I'm going to turn that on now. Now, the first thing to do is to wet your hands all over thoroughly first like that. Get your hands wet. And today I'm going to use some liquid soap. Now, you, after you've got your hands wet, you can actually knock that off with your elbow if you want. Get your liquid soap. Now, I'm using liquid soap today, but you could equally well use a bar of soap. That's all absolutely fine. And quickly just get it on your hands. And then the first movement I want to show you is that. That's palm to palm. Cleaning the palms of your hands like that. Nice, clean palms. Then the next thing we want to clean is the backs of our hands and the front of our hands. So for that, we do this. And we interlace our hands like that on that side. And if you've got a wedding ring on like me, just loosen it a bit and wash underneath. Clinically, we would never wear stone rings, but bland wedding bands are fine. And on that side then, on the other side like that. So we're doing it on both sides. Then we want to do it in lace fingers again, but front to front like that, that movement. Now the next one is grip to grip like this. So you want to do it like that, get into all those palms and that also gets your knuckles into your, into your palms, side to side, and then the other way, like that. Now what a lot of people forget is their thumbs. So one thumb here and a twisting movement like that. And the other thumb there in a twisting movement like that. Now we want to give our palms and our fingertips a particularly good clean. So now we go round our palms with our fingertips. First on that hand, then on that hand. Then we want to do the wrists, up to the wrists, and again on that side. There we are, so we've done both palms now. Now we can use our elbow, and now we can rinse rinse thoroughly and this should take not less than 20 seconds really 20 to 30 seconds and then when I finish we don't want to touch our hands with that dirty tap so let's knock it off with the elbow now I like to use uh, some roll like this I'm going to get a couple of rolls a couple of pieces like that and I'm just going to dry my hands Drying in all the little notches, drying under my ring. Maybe a bit more. And now my hands are, are very clean. Now if I'm in a public toilet, I've now got a bit of a problem because I need to get out of the public toilet. Or if I have a tap with an old fashioned twizzly thing, then I could turn that off by putting that on the tap like that, so I'm not re-dirtying my hand. And then if we go over to the door here, if we go over to the door handle, so the door, the door here is closed. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna keep that like that, and I'm gonna put that on the door handle, because public toilets are notoriously dirty places. I'm gonna open the handle like that so I can get out, then I'm gonna close that in that hand, and then discard everything into a bin and then I can leave with clean hands. If you want more advice, wisdom, guidance from other successful entrepreneurs on how you can navigate the coronavirus situation, check out the video right there next to me. I hope you find it valuable. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. It's commercially closed. There's not a lot you can do right now.